Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us on this rainy morning for the penultimate in this semester's series of TGIFHI, which is the Franklin Humanities Institute's Friday morning series that gives Duke faculty in the humanities, interpretive social sciences and the arts the opportunity to present on their current research to interlocutors in their fields and in related fields and allows you, the audience, to get to know us. There is no agenda or theme. We simply ask faculty to present on the work that is most exciting to them at this time, um, that they would go off and give in other venues perhaps as well. Um, and uh, it is very nice for us, all, all of us here at FHI, to invite our colleagues, students um, back into our space, everyone um, back into our space for the kinds of intimate conversations to which we've become accustomed at FHI. And on the website of FHI, you can find recordings of most of our past TGI FHIs, actually, and also an interview with Ryan in which he describes his work. So this morning, I'm very pleased to introduce Ryan Donovan, who is Assistant Professor of Theatre Studies and is a new faculty member who just joined us in 2022. His areas of interest include musical theatre studies, musical theatre performance, 20th and 21st century U.S. drama, U.S. dance history, theatre history, disability studies, fat studies, LGBTQ plus studies, American studies, lots of studies, lots of studies, studying a lot over there. Um, he received his PhD in 2019 from the Graduate Center, um, uh, the CUNY Graduate Center in Theater and Performance and with an American Studies certificate. Extraordinarily, given that he just finished in 2019, he has two books, uh, two monographs about to appear. One next week, which is very exciting, um, called Broadway Bodies, A Critical History of Conformity, um, that is coming out with Oxford University Press. And in July, Queer Approaches in Musical Theatre from Matthew in Bloomsbury, which will, um, as I said, just in, in July. I mean, that's kind of extraordinary, two, two within a few months of each other. Um, and also, if that wasn't enough, an edited volume, The Routledge Companion to Musical Theatre, was co-edited with Laura MacDonald and William Everett that is appearing from Routledge. He's also co-edited um, uh, a special issue of studies in musical theatre with um, Joanna D. Das, um, and, um, and he's published in articles in a number of different venues. Queer approaches in musical theater, I understand, will introduce readers to a facet of musicals often assumed but misunderstood, how queer approaches extend deeper than fabulosity. Queerness in musical challenges the typical heteronormative, their typical hot heteronormativity, he writes, but also sometimes simultaneously reinforced it, reinforces it. Um, in, um, in uh, um, uh, Broadway Bodies, A Critical History of Conformity, I can tell you that you can get a little sneak preview of it um, if you look on Amazon, I'm sorry, on the evil empire. Um, uh, but uh, but, but uh, you, you can already, one week in advance, read, read uh, the introduction. Um, in that uh, book, he centers on how ability, sexuality, and size intersect with gender, race, and ethnicity in casting and performance in order to ask, quote, how does the use of fat suits, for example, even in ostensibly fat positive musicals like Hairspray, actually stigmatize fatness? What were the political implications of casting two white heterosexual actors as the gay couple in La Cage aux Folles in 1983? How did Broadway respond to movements for LGBTQ plus equality and the increased presence of newly out actors? And how did deaf actors 
change the sound of musicals in Deaf West Broadway revivals? How do musicals use the aesthetics of physical difference as metaphors for disability, he writes. What happens when non-conforming bodies attempt to fit into a system that denies them a full range of representation? And as he goes through these questions that, that, that we generally understood, understand to be about associated with certain social, social movements as well for, for, um, uh, for bodily justice, as it were, he is also thinking about these um, ideas of things like um, ability um, in the forms of labor, um, the labor of casting and labor in casting in relation to um, into an idea of, of what he understands as the neoliberal body, um, uh, where um, certain kinds of ideas of bodily perfection are employed um, uh, um, and, and indeed internalized, um, in order, in order to, um, uh, give us a sense of managing our own body into, into some kind of idea of abstracted perfection. Um, so, uh, with that, I am going to ask you to join me in welcoming Ryan. His talk today is must be heavy set casting size and the body politics of Broadway musicals. Please join me in welcome. Thank you. I think I need you to introduce me at every talk in the future. That was so lovely. Um, thank you all for for being here today on this on this rainy Friday morning and. Um, um, thank you to those of you that don't know me for showing up to this. There's a lot of new faces and that's really exciting to see. So thank you for being here. Um, so as Ranji said today, I'm sharing an excerpt from my new book, Broadway Bodies, which comes out next week um, from Oxford University Press. Um, I guess I can kind of skip over some of this since you introduced the book so beautifully. Um, but I will say... <laughs> I will say that um, in the book, I, I examine Broadway's ambivalent inclusion of bodies that exceed, subvert, or challenge Broadway's ideal body, the conventionally attractive, hyper-fit, hyper-able, triple threat performer who represents the ultimate commodification of the body in the Broadway economy. I organized the book around size, sexuality, and ability, and each section respectively draws from the fields of fat studies, disability studies, and LGBTQ plus studies. Today, I'm gonna to read from the first chapter in the section on size and casting, which focuses on the 1981 musical Dream Girls, which is a highly fictionalized retelling of the rise and fall of Diana Ross and the Supremes. The musical made a star of 21 year old Jennifer Holliday, who played Effie White, the former lead singer of girl group, The Dreams, who was pushed aside for the vocally smaller voiced and thinner bodied Dina Jones. The group's manager considered, uh, the group's manager Curtis considered Dina, who had been previously singing backup to Effie, more attractive and more in line with what he felt white audiences wanted. Uh, we're gonna listen to the moment that Effie finds out about this change. And this slide is slightly, uh, a little uh, quiet. So uh, listen up. <laughs> and Effie. Dina's gonna sing Lee. Dina's doing what? Lee. But what do you mean, Dina's doing Lee? I do Lee. I always sing Lee. We're changing it. We finally get the chance to have our own act, and Dina's gonna sing Lee? She can't sing like I can. She's right. I can't. I, 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 I don't wanna do it. You'll do what I tell you. That's a new act. A new sound, a new look. A new look. Nobody can see her on a record. So that's the pivotal line there. Nobody can see her on a record. Uh, a few times a generation, the meeting of an actor and a character in a musical creates something truly magical. And Holiday's legendary performance as Effie White in Dreamgirls was one such occasion. She won the Tony Award for her performance but Effie was the first, and as of this writing, only role that she ever originated in a new Broadway musical. 
After Dreamgirls, she has only appeared as a replacement in supporting roles in Broadway musical revivals. What happened? Her career serves as a touchstone for how Broadway casts fat women and, and the narrow range of representation the industry's gatekeepers permit Black women in musicals to embody. Being a fat Black woman is less a kind of triple threat than it is a triple whammy on Broadway. And each of these three facets of her identity, size, race, and gender, overdetermined both Holiday's career and her critical reception. It is always open season on fat people in the U.S. Body shaming, fat phobia, and fat stigma run rampant. Casting Broadway musicals reiterates dominant attitude, attitudes toward all fat women and fat Black women in particular. Multiple conflicting narratives exist around Holiday's casting and performance as Effie, so much so um, that her presence continues to loom large over the role, even when it's played by another actor. And today I'll talk about how Dreamgirls will never leave Holiday as much as she can never leave Dreamgirls. But the show did go on after she left it, and casting and recasting the role became the locus for a myriad of labor issues. Broadway musicals, even ostensibly fat positive ones, are complicit in labor practices that prolong stigma at the same time that they enforce gendered and racialized stereotypes of size and sometimes include racist, sexist, and fat phobic representations. The onstage and offstage narratives of Dreamgirls demonstrate how Broadway musicals and U.S. society reify the structural inequalities that regulate gender, race, and size. Broadway is a battleground for body politics, and it demands that fat ladies sing. Dreamgirls explores themes of racial capitalism, which legal scholar Nancy Leong defines as, quote, the process of deriving social and economic value from the racial identity of another person. The show also explores the oral and visual politics of selling out and crossing over. In noting the show's presence on Broadway, Essence Magazine critic Bonnie Allen's critique lays bare a cruel irony of the consequences of uh, the very racial capitalism that the show itself sought to critique in its narrative. She writes, they'd untaken our blues and gone to a place where we can't afford to hear them. Maybe that's the ultimate form of crossover. Allen points out uh, implicitly the whiteness of Broadway audiences and the fact that the high ticket prices precluded many Black people from attending the show, which mirrors how in the narrative, uh, the attempt to reach white audiences uh, for their music trumped everything. Dreamgirls' onstage narrative resonates more than most musicals with its offstage body politics too, since it is about the valorization of thinness. The show's conflicts center on gender in and beyond the music industry, and crucially, body size, which became quite a vexing issue when it came to recasting Effie, who represents a, synec a synecdoche for the spaces in which Broadway permits fat Black women's presence. But before I go into that further, let's talk about the word fat and the academic field of fat studies. Fat studies emerged from the fat liberation movement in the 1970s, and it embraces its radical stance toward the mainstream. Fat Studies analyzes how stigma extends beyond moral judgments to the ways that fat people, especially fat women, are denied full participation in U.S. society. Fat Studies scholar Kathleen Lebesco notes that the work of the field is to fight back against, quote, how in the United States, the bearer of a fat body is marked as a failed citizen inasmuch as her powers as a worker, shopper, and racially desirable subject are called into question, end quote. People typically say fat as an insult, and using the word can be initially discomforting. In order to neutralize that stigma, though, um, activists and scholars have reclaimed and repurposed the word fat. Since, as fat activist Marilyn Wan notes, quote, seemingly well-meaning euphemisms like heavy, plump, husky, and so forth, put a falsely positive spin on a negative view of fatness. Casting notices and critics' reviews are littered with these euphemisms. Hairspray star Marissa Jarrett Winokur even kept a record of how the media described her body when she was describing when she was starring as Tracy Turnblad on Broadway in 2002. Uh, here she is telling Katie Couric exactly why the euphemisms bug her. 
Well, I know yeah. that you're a little annoyed that people don't just say she's fat. Now, why is that? <laughs> now, now, people have described you as plus well, thigh, yeah. dimpled knee. You know, I guess you're, you're what, that they're flippy footing around? Well, it's almost like they don't want to just use that adjective. And it's uh -huh. like, well, that's not the big deal. I think people, I think writers and other people just want to come up with other words to be creative when it's like, well, whatever, who cares? Right, and do you think they should mention it at all, or do you think well, it's irrelevant? I think it's relevant because of our show. I think if it was a different situation, it's not relevant at all. The avoidance of simply saying fat admits the discomfort it causes uh, to use the word, which in turn leads to not acknowledging the ways that fat people are marginalized despite their ubiquity. Fat is notable for its visibility, which raises the paradox of feeling invisible as a fat person. Fat stigma too rests on this paradox of visibility because it makes certain bodies invisible due to the very visible attributes that stigmatize them. Fat people may be stared at and also ignored. Lack of representation clearly articulates the devaluation of fat people, which underlines the systemic structural nature of the value placed on the minority rule of thin, hyperfit bodies. Fat becomes stigmatized because society perceives it as something that a person can put on or take off at will. In other words, something that one can control but chooses not to. In other words, pe fat people shirk the mandate of personal responsibility that undergirds neoliberal capitalism. Society equates fat with personal failure too, since in this view, the fat person's inability to control their behaviors and appetites reveals their inability to conform to dominant body aesthetics too. Additionally, the ties between class, gender, and size and the ensuing stigma materialize in wage penalties. According to a 2015 study, a woman who is just perceived as being overweight earns $9,000 less per year than her thinner women peers. This is a vicious cycle. Anti-fat attitudes lead to fat women who earn less being pressured to spend more to weigh less. The cost of being black, fat, and a woman is material. The wage penalty for being a black woman in the U.S. means that for every dollar a white man earns, a black woman earns just 64 cents. If black women's labor is clearly so devalued in the U.S., then their laboring bodies are too. Anti-fat prejudice persists as a socioeconomic issue intimately connected to race. That fat stigma finds many of its roots in the pseudoscience of eugenics should come as no surprise. Around the turn of the 20th century, eugenicists equated the pursuit of a fit body with the dominance and survival of the white race. Fear of fat and fear of blackness became intermingled. Sociologist Sabrina Strings argues that fatness became stigmatized as both black and sinful as a result of 19th and 20th century moralistic attitudes that became the foundation for the treatment of black Americans that continues unabated. String concludes that, quote, the fear of the black body was integral to the creation of the slender aesthetic among fashionable white Americans, end quote. Thinness itself became yet another form of American exceptionalism bound to the aesthetics of whiteness. Body aesthetics are always already gendered and racialized in this country. The combination of the aesthetic and economic values placed on gender and race led to what Bell, Ho Bell Hooks terms, quote, a devaluation of black womanhood that permeated the psyches of all Americans and shaped the, the social status of all black women. This devaluation continues to inform how black women and their bodies are treated in representation and in reality. Fat stigma's relationship to the labor practice of casting raises many questions as a result. How do fat female bodies fit into socioeconomic and represent representational systems that diminish them, especially the closed economy of Broadway musicals? How are fat bodies gendered, racialized, and sexualized in musicals? How do Broadway musicals paradoxically normalize and stigmatize these bodies in production through the use of fat suits and in reception through tone deaf and often cruel critical responses. Broadway's body issues repeat broader structural patterns of discrimination in the US since in Broadway musicals themselves, the defining issue is who counts as American and how that matters as musicologist Raymond Knapp puts it. In other words, who is represented on stage and how they are represented reflects their status as an American on stage and off. 
Given how fat bodies are marked and how musicals attempt to define who counts, where does this leave fat bodies on Broadway and especially fat black women's bodies? The casting of Broadway musicals demonstrates that some bodies are deemed superior to others. The language used to discuss casting reinforces the relationship between body type and visibility. We talk about getting seen for roles and whether or not an actor is the right fit, which means that some bodies are not seen and some do not fit. Broadway traffics and stereotypes and actors are often bluntly told they aren't the right fit because of their appearance. While numerous subjective factors go into casting, the fact remains that fat phobia is often a primary barrier to employment. Nearly all leading roles are typically cast with bodies that conform to thinness, even when the scripts or character description does not mention weight. Broadway has not cast a fat Cinderella, Nellie Forbush, or Eliza Doolittle, even though nothing about these roles inherently requires thinness. To cast a fat woman in one of these leads would be to implicitly admit that fat women have been denied the full range of representations commonly available to thin women. Broadway allows fat women to be powerful or funny, but rarely desirable. Effie White in Dreamgirls became an iconic role not only because it is a star-making part, but also because its visibility as a leading role available to Black women underscores how the character's narrative arc is tied to visibility itself. The role uniquely gives a fat Black woman the chance to play a full range of emotions and emerge as something other than a victim. Marisha Wallace, who played Effie in the 2017 West End production of Dreamgirls, knows that this is a rarity. She observed, quote, as a Black woman, you never get a full arc. You only get a caricature. And said that it was kind of nice to do all of these, all of those things in one show, which prompted her to ask, why aren't there more roles like this? Musical theater scholar Stacey Wolf's observation that musicals punish women in their narratives, but celebrate them in performance applies doubly here. Since Black women often have agency in performance through their bodies that does not exist in the text or the narrative. As performance scholar Daphne Brooks explains, but Black women's bodies continue to bear the gross insult and burden of spectacular representational exploitation, end quote. Performance can shore up or destabilize this burden through the body of, quote, the performer who through gestures and speech is able to confound and disrupt conventional constructions of the racialized and gendered body, end quote. Yet I also want to put forward that even a musical like The Wiz from 1975, which is a Black retelling of The Wizard of Oz, which, and it's as, as expressive of Black joy as Broadway gets, has its own kind of fat phobia because uh, its villain, Evil Lean, is the only fat person, the only fat woman in the show usually. And she's even referred to as your fatness at one point, uh, just before Dorothy throws the bucket of water on her and exterminates her. In an industry where appearance matters for employability, Black women are still held to bodily standards of beauty determined by whiteness. These standards simultaneously mask and mirror how the very form of the Broadway musical itself depends upon Black aesthetics of movement and sound. And since these two have been long been whitewashed for mainstream audiences, it makes a perverse sense that the kind of, that the bodies on stage are subjected to similar processes. For evidence that the casting of Broadway musicals reproduces patterns of exclusion from the U.S., one need look no further than to the fact that since Hairspray opened in 2002, fewer than 20 musicals have opened on Broadway with Black women in the leading role. Size and race only compound the lack of available leading roles. And this tally of fewer than 20 musicals represents less than 10% of the more than 250 Broadway musicals that have opened since 2002. When a fat female actor walks into an audition, sociocultural expectations accompany her. While all actors are often told they aren't the right fit because of their appearance, fat women also confront assumptions about who counts as fat. The casting director told one actor I interviewed, you're not fat enough to be our fat girl. The language in casting breakdowns guides actors to self-select which roles seem appropriate for them gender, height, race, and weight requirements narrowed the pool even further on top of uh, requirements of vocal range and dance ability. 
for a glaring example of this kind of language, uh, in 2016, there was a production of this old musical called The Golden Apple at uh, New York City Center Encore series. And their casting notice repeatedly stated, we are not looking for heavy character actresses. Sometimes they say the quiet part out loud. When it comes to size and casting, Broadway continues to rely upon outdated and narrow notions of body type. Casting necessarily remains an, an inherently fraught and subjective labor practice, the consequences, the consequences of which extend beyond simply who gets the part. While being discriminated in casting falls under the umbrella of creative license, the lack of opportunities for fat actors reveals that weight-based discrimination is and has been so widespread on Broadway that the industry accepts it not just as natural, but as neutral. Considered in light of the fact that uh, more than two thirds of American women could be classified as overweight or obese, it becomes more galling that size plays such an important part in casting. Despite the vague and indeterminate meanings of overweight and obese and their uh, pathologizing implications, the majority of women in the United States could claim fat as an identity. This is statistically the most common kind of body to inhabit in America, and yet also at once the most un-American. And perhaps no musical wades in these waters quite like Dreamgirls. And no one was thrust into the spotlight quite like its 21-year-old star, Jennifer Holliday, who had been in workshops of the musical since she was 19. Dreamgirls producer and director choreographer Michael Bennett's associate, Bob Avian recalls, uh, she was very young, heavy, and definitely did not fit the glamorous image of a leading lady. She did, however, possess a voice that was a gift from heaven. And that's um, Holiday on the left there. Uh, how, and she famously left the production during the summer before its Broadway opening, following a disagreement over her character's then downward trajectory and uh, her absence from the second act. Recasting the role proved difficult even then before the show made it out of workshops and to Broadway. It turned out that nobody could sing the act one finale and I am telling you I'm not going quite like Holiday and everyone realized the show they need, that, that the show needed her. So uh, Holiday and Bennett reconciled leading uh, writer Tom Ian and composer Henry Krieger to write her character back into the second act she rejoined the production and won the Tony Award. Yet in the summer of 1981, they could not have foreseen how this period would come to mark Holiday's life and later help to blur the lines between her and the character she played. To a surprising degree, Holiday's career would eerily come to mirror Effie's. The parallels between them were striking. Both were young, fat black women with big voices perceived as difficult. Avian remembers, Jennifer was always on the verge of being difficult. It seemed to be a form of self-protection for her. She was 21. I just want to remind people of that. Um, while starring in the 1983 Los Angeles production of Dream Girls, Holiday told an interviewer, from the very beginning, I've managed to maintain the separate identity from the show that I've always hoped for. When a performance of Dream Girls ends at 11.20 p.m., Effie stays on stage and Jennifer goes home. To be perfectly honest, I don't mind having that close identification with the character because, quite frankly, I do consider it my show. Over time, however, Holiday herself came to see the parallels, which she explained to CBS Sunday Morning in 2006 when the uh, film adaptation starring Jennifer Hudson came out. But there is one aspect of Jennifer Hudson's success that haunts Jennifer Holiday to this day. She got to take Effie off. And I never got to take that thing off. I always had to be a. That, that destroys me more than anything else. I, just, I don't know if you could hear, but she said, I always had to be Effie. I never got to take Effie off. The link between Effie and Holiday became as much about size as anything. Holiday became known as much for the size of her voice as for the size of her body. CBS correspondent Russ Mitchell confirmed this overlap, noting offstage, Jennifer Holliday and Effie White were becoming one and the same, struggling with weight problems and feelings of rejection. Holliday gained 100 pounds in one year and became more and more isolated. 
In a 2016 interview, Holiday recalled her body size when she was starring in Dreamgirls, saying, it was such an awkward size for me, you know, so sometimes it's still very hard for me to look back having lost 200 pounds. And so now to kind of look back at that time, sometimes I feel like I don't want to go back there. Being a fat Black woman and starring in a Broadway hit in 1981 meant that Holiday was an open target for mainstream critics who openly denigrated her size, often in the same sentence in which they lauded her talent. Acknowledging her weight to some degree is understandable. It was and still remains notable when Broadway casts a fat actress of any race in a leading role, let alone a fat Black woman. Critics went out of their way to find similes and euphemisms to describe Holiday's body, though. Clive Barnes wrote, quote, Miss Holiday is just tremendous. Something like a battleship should be named after her. Walter Kerr explained, Miss Holiday, in a rasp of rage called I am telling you I'm not going, pumps enough blood and bile and reedy power into her song to make us suspect that once she's done, she'll finish him off in two bites. The critics, all white men, and their repugnant ways of writing about body size reveal just how socially acceptable it was in 1981 to openly disparage fat people in the press. The black press, however, referred to Holiday's body quite differently when they mentioned it at all. Uh, Monique Lamaster's review in the Los Angeles Sentinel, for instance, only discusses Holiday's performance and then only in terms of superlatives. Ali Stanton, writing in the New York Amsterdam News, noted, uh, quote, in a society where to be thin is almost like being black was in the 60s, beautiful, the talented Jennifer not only must accept the fact that she is a rather plump pigeon, although pretty, but she must also listen to a song admonishing, you got so heavy on me, what blatant torture. Stanton was among few critics to note the social pressure to be thin, as well as how performing the show itself might have felt to Holiday. <clears throat> in the show's pivotal scene, where Effie is at once dumped by her boyfriend slash manager and fired from the group, she is also told she's getting fatter all the time. Let's watch. <laughs> I've been warning you since Chicago to clean up your act. You've been late, you've been mean, giving all kinds of stupid flack. That's a lie, that's a lie. It's just I haven't been feeling that well. Effie, please, stop excusing yourself. You've been late, you've been mean, and getting better all the time. Now you're lying, you're lying. I've never been so thin. She's actually secretly pregnant in this scene, and nobody knows yet, but um, I'll talk more about that. In a, in a little bit. One thing was consistently clear. Critics clearly saw the conflict in Dreamgirls as being about Effie's size, especially when played by Holiday. Ebony Magazine explained, quote, Effie is dropped because she's overweight, not very glamorous, thought of as a troublemaker, and has a voice that is a bit too black for crossover appeal to white audiences. In the New York Times, Frank Rich wrote, Effie no longer fits. She's fat, and her singing is anything but light. Also in the Times, Kerr noted that the group's manager replaced Effie partly because of a troublesome temperament, but mainly because he, quote, wants to replace her with a slimmer look and a tamer sound. A consensus of critics agreed that Effie was made to sing back up and then fired because she was gaining weight. And yet the production's creative team would later go on to disavow Effie's size as they sought to reframe the narrative of the show after Holiday left and they needed to recast the part. Although Holiday eventually stopped playing Effie, she continues to be so associated with the role that most reviews of Dreamgirls written since 1981 still mention her, as does this headline, which openly you know, says, Dreamgirls invites comparison. Uh, the headline of Newsweek's review of the 2017 West End production explicitly posed the comparison asking, is Amber Riley's Effie a match for Jennifer Holiday? And at, at, at this point, we're talking 36 years after the original production, and she's still, the reviews are still all about her. Uh, her success clearly created a problem for the original creative team when it came to casting her replacements, because not only did they need the specific talent and ability required to sing and act the role, they had to follow this legendary performance and somehow still make it their own. This wasn't necessarily a negative for those performers, though, as Sharon Brown, who later played Effie, observed, everybody is amazing as Effie because Jennifer Holliday set the bar so high. 
When asked whether it would be difficult to replace Holiday, Bennett replied, well, I have understudies right now who are very good in the role. I think that I will find other people who will be very good in it. They will be different. Keisha Lewis, who understudied Effie in the original uh, production, recounted, none of us sounded like Holiday. We didn't all have to be like Holiday. However, if the creative team allowed for some flexibility, audiences and critics came in with different expectations. Holiday's first replacement on Broadway was Vanessa Townsell, and that's her in the two slides on the left there, uh, who was an unknown telephone operator cast out of an open call in Los Angeles during a nationwide talent search. An article in the Times covering her debut in the role noted that uh, Holiday is a larger woman than Miss Townsell, and because girth figured in the plot, Miss Townsell was aiming to be one of the other singers in the trio. Having gained weight eating out of boredom at her phone job, she recalled, I put on a black dress for the audition to slim myself. Critics compared replacements not only to Holiday's performance, but to her body in ways that other replacement actors in this production were not compared to the original actors. Rich re-reviewed the production for the Times with its new star, contending that uh, Townsell, quote, scales Effie down in a way that serves the show. Both more reserved and less hefty than her predecessor, this actress is more in balance with the other dreams and more credibly their victim. His review is typical of how many critics described how, how Holiday's body haunted Effie as much as her voice. When she left the Broadway show, uh, Holiday went to Los Angeles to star in the premier West Coast engagement where uh, she started missing a lot of shows, which caused a lot of losses at the box office. And her standby, Lilius White, ended up taking over the role and getting a lot of media attention because the producers needed to sell her to potential ticket buyers. Uh, and one thing I, I wanna highlight here is this interview in, uh, local, on local TV in LA in 1983 during that production where she talks about playing the part. And, uh, and they pad you, don't they? Yes, they pad me for the first act. Why do they pad you? Well, because there are a lot of uh, inferences made to Effie being overweight in the first act. Mm -hmm. And it also makes more sense when she comes back in the second act to have, and when she sings, I'm changing, to really have changed and have lost the weight and to really have this wonderful look and be glamorous and different from the person that she was mm -hmm. seven years before. This is uh, the song she's referring to, I Am Changing. The, the once open acknowledgement of Effie's size, however, disappeared once Holiday left the original production and the LA production. Uh, the creative team took pains to disavow Effie as fat and by extension, Holiday's body and her association with the role. Recasting Dreamgirls mirrored its narrative excuse me, as the producers and creative team replaced Holiday with noticeably thinner actors, just like Effie was replaced in the lineup of the dreams. The producer surely felt the need to ensure that the show remained a viable property without Holiday, reasonable enough considering uh, the number of jobs and the amount of money involved. However, the means taken to achieve this end are striking. When the LA production moved to San Francisco, uh, Violet Wells, a press agent working on it, explicitly slammed Holiday to a, a reporter saying, quote, people who have worked with Holiday feel that at this point it works better without her. Essentially, it's an ensemble show, not a star show, and she was playing it like a star. She then zeroed in on Holiday's body, saying the others who have played Effie have not been such big women. You could understand why a manager wouldn't want an ungainly looking woman in a group like The Dreams. In addition to the production's own press agent, uh, critics and headline writers in California also went to town writing about Holiday's body. And here you can see they even in the headline call it a hefty role. Critics, critics discussed fat and specifically Holiday's body as if it alone had the power to disrupt the narrative of the musical and the audience's reception of it. Jack Viertel wrote a feature on the show's new star, Lilius White, during the LA run encapsulating the production's turn against Holiday. He explained, quote, but something essential changes when White plays the role. She's not fat and she's not especially ungainly either. She doesn't intimidate us in the way Holiday does 
and everything about Dreamgirls becomes a little less obvious and a little more human than it was before. Yertel was far from alone in using this kind of rhetoric to describe the impact of Holiday's absence. Reviewing the 1983 San Francisco production, uh, Gerald Nachman wrote that uh, the original production, quote, starred alleged blockbuster Jennifer Holiday, a two-ton shouter who smothered the musical, crushed all plot sense with her bulk, and bent the show out of shape with her presence. An article published in the San Rafael, California Independent Journal just before the production opened in San Francisco invited readers to feel sympathy for Lilius White precisely because she was thin and the production required her to wear a fat suit. White noted that the padding was uncomfortable, but she also told the interviewer that she believed obesity is a health hazard and said, quote, I don't ever want to be overweight. Writer Steve Cassell posed the question to her that would haunt dream girls ever since. But does Effie really need to be fat? White told him, you know, this is a few months after that TV interview we just watched. White told him the way the show was put together, it was never designed to be about a girl who was replaced because she's fat. The show was not written about a fat girl. It's about a girl who can't change with the times, who can't conform like everybody else. Yet it is Effie's body that is non-conforming as much as her unwillingness to sing like everyone else and make her voice smaller. The marked change in White's rhetoric from her LA television appearance, wherein she addressed the numerous references to Effie's weight, foreshadowed what has become an ongoing point of contention. The question of whether Effie is fat or not has continued to vex and provoke critics, fans, and those who have played the role alike. The unwillingness of some critics to see Holiday as fully human remains disturbing, and the debate over whether the plot makes more or less sense with a thinner actress returns each time Dreamgirls does. Uh, a fan thread on the broadwayworld.com message board titled Effie White, Does She Have to Be Heavy? generated over 170 responses when the film adaptation premiered in 2006. User Margot Channing posted a detailed history of the casting of the role on Broadway and argued, quote, that weight was the last criterion Bennett was looking for as far as future Effies were concerned. It may or may not have been the last criterion, but it was undeniably part of his consideration. When Roz Ryan was playing the role in 1984, she said uh, to the press, the reason that they removed Effie to put in the new girl was for the look. It had nothing to do with Effie's talent, going on to note that she herself, quote, had been a fairly large woman all my life. The fact that Bennett cast thinner actors like Sharon Brown as Effie complicates the question of whether Effie is fat or not. When Brown played Effie on tour in LA later in the 80s, a headline in the LA Times Review noted her body size. It reads, Dream Girl Strikes Svelte's New Chord. Critic Don Shirley described how the meaning of the musical changed for him as a result, writing, no longer is it possible to interpret the show as a plea on behalf of the overweight. Brown, unlike her celebrated predecessor, Jennifer Holliday, looks as if her Effie could actually fit the conventional notion of a dream girl without too much strain. He goes on to argue that with Brown as Effie, he feels the conflict is only about Effie's voice, not her size. He concludes, without the cosmetic issues raised by Holliday, the show may lose a little of its pathos, but its analysis of cultural history becomes clearer and more meaningful. For surely the fact that size was just a cosmetic issue that somehow obscures its meaning uh, belies his ambivalence about the role that size actually plays in the show. Size fundamentally matters to Dreamgirls' production and reception. It's more than skin deep. It's actually part of the show's DNA. Throughout the life of the original production, Bennett and others from the creative team very publicly tried to dispel notions that Effie was fat, and had to be cast with a fat actor, while nevertheless frequently casting fat actors in the role. Bennett told the San Jose Mercury News just before the San Francisco production, I'm very happy that Lilius is here as Effie because the play is much more in proportion with her. As Jennifer put on weight, it became about how they throw the fat girl out. Well, that's not the story of the play. It's about how they needed a pop singer to make the white charts. Other members of the creative team would go on to double down on this story when Dreamgirls came back to Broadway in 1987, uh, one week before Bennett died of AIDS. Co-choreographer Michael Peters told the New York Times, 
there's a greater focus on the human element now that comes as a result of the change in scale and the fact that without Jennifer, the show becomes more of an ensemble piece. Writer Tom Ian was even more direct, telling the Daily News, actually, I had never envisioned Effie as a heavy person. It worked out fine, but that wasn't the original intention. My idea was of a mentally heavy person, heavy attitudes, a lot of pressures on her. Ian's attempt to rewrite the history of casting Effie runs into one major roadblock, archival evidence. The problem with these post-factum arguments is that apart from the gross willingness to dis disparage Holiday to the press, clear documentation exists that the creators did envision Effie as at the very least chubby, if not uh, a real fat girl as one casting notice indelicately stated. What they decided the, distinct, the distinction between chubby and fat was remains unclear. When Dream Girls was uh, simply called the Tom Ian musical, a casting notice in Backstage newspaper in July 1980 appeared, which demonstrates that Ian actually had considered size important enough to be part of the description. And you see highlighted there, uh, Effie Melody White, short, semi-heavy, difficult black diva with a great voice. A 1981 casting breakdown from Johnson Liff Casting Agency for uh, the iteration of the show then called Big Dreams listed the following requirements. Effie White, age 18 to 30, black, battleship singing voice, has to do it all, incredible range from low to very high, gospel background is good, must have great emotional as well as technical range, great soul, can be chubby or chunky, but should not be a real fat girl. Does not have to be a great beauty, should have character as opposed to real sex appeal and glamour. Must have strong dramatic facility and weight. This language went on to become the standard breakdown for the role. Uh, a handwritten draft of an earlier casting breakdown likely written during pre-production states, women should come in looking really foxy and attractive. For Effie's, this is not important. While these descriptions raise the question of what a real fat girl is, they also point out whose bodies the casting team likely considered foxy and attractive and whose they didn't. The irony of all of this, of course, is that Holiday, a real fat girl, according to critics and the creative team, won the role and a Tony Award for playing it, and they felt that they couldn't do the show without her. The description of Effie in a 1982 casting notice for future replacements removed any description of her body, however. Uh, undoubtedly, the character of Effie changed and developed throughout the course of the show's development, but the sustained disavowals of Effie as not fat further ring false when one considers that Nell Carter played Effie in the very first workshop in the late 1970s. And in one of the ultimate absurdities of this show and this um, backstage fracas that I'm talking about is the fact that um, you know, the plot is about Effie being too fat to be the lead singer on television. Carter quit the show because she was becoming a television star on shows like Ryan's Hope and Give Me a Break. By the time Dreamgirls uh, cast its bus and truck tour in 1985, the language used to describe Effie's body had changed again. The casting breakdown opens by stating, everyone in the cast must be between 18 and a young 35. It is important that everyone in the cast be very attractive and have great style and charisma. Women should be five foot four to five foot eight, must move well and be sexy and feminine. Predictably, the description of Effie reads quite differently. Uh, and the important part here that I want to highlight is um, right before the Dina Jones uh, notice where it says she should be different in some way from the other girls for this role. Once again, the description singles Effie out as unattractive and unfeminine, even if size was now absent from the breakdown. The shift in narrative around Dreamgirls' casting was partially achieved by sometimes hiring thinner actors who uh, crucially wore fat suits pictured here. Um, some, though not all of these replacements wore padding, which is made of foam and latex, usually very heavy and very uncomfortable to wear. Dream girls use padding to make Effie replacements resemble Holiday, especially if they were thin. Actor Yvette Quezon recalled that she was a size six when she auditioned for the show, 
hoping to be cast as one of the other backup singers in the dreams, Laurel. When she was cast as Effie, she said, they put a fat suit on me, which I took off in the second act. It looked like I had been to Weight Watchers. Lilius White also auditioned with the role of Laurel in mind, later saying she, quote, had no interest in being Effie since she was like a size six or seven and was not going to gain 200 pounds. It is therefore curious that while Vanessa Townsell, uh, Ho Holiday's Broadway replacement, was evidently not wearing a fat suit, White was wearing one as Effie in the production in California, where she was sharing the role with Holiday initially, as did several women who followed Holiday and Townsell in the role on Broadway. Ultimately, if Effie's weight is not supposed to matter and have no bearing on the plot, then why did the creative team approve of Holiday's replacements wearing fat suits at all? What then of the fact that when Holiday herself returned to play Effie in a 1994 Atlanta production, uh, after having gastric bypass surgery, she wore a fat suit. In the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, Dan Holbert wrote, we should all have the problem Jennifer Holliday faces in the revival of her Tony Award winning role in Dreamgirls, she's too thin. Note the echoes of the earlier feature on Lilius White. Holliday said, quote, I have to wear a fat suit for the show. I'm a size eight now, but Effie's got to be an 18, so I need some serious padding. She returned to the role again in Atlanta in 2007, this time without padding. Her attitude toward Effie's body was different this time. She said, I am substantially smaller than I was back then. It didn't change the character, but it did make a change in terms of what I was going to try to do. Wear a fat suit? I opted not to just to see if I had enough acting chops to pull it off. To show the emotions of the woman in love and her heartache. Whether or not Effie is fat changes the musical. If Effie is visibly thin, it makes little sense when Curtis accuses her of getting fatter all the time. The most recent time Holiday played Effie was in a 2012, uh, sorry, 2021 production at the Muni in St. Louis. Holiday told a reporter then that uh, she and the director will have to decide whether she needs to play Effie wearing a fat suit. The fact that the debate over Effie's size has been reframed to the point that thinness itself became the issue only highlights how much of a problem fatness is perceived to be. The use of a fat suit represents a deliberate choice on the production's part to ensure a character looks a certain way, a decision not made lightly given the expense of creating custom-made costumes and padding. However, the use of fat suits is more complicated than simply falling under the broad category of artistic license. The use of um, the fat suit itself reinforces stigma because it can be put on and taken off at will, an act unavailable to fat people who society perceives as morally suspect for their inability, supposed inability to lose weight. The implicit message sent by fat suits is that fat is somehow a performance, recalling the casting notice explaining that Effie should not be a real fat girl. Though the debate over whether Effie is fat may never be settled, the fact remains that Effie is one of few leading roles available to fat black women in Broadway musicals, but also one whose casting is highly contested due in part to anti-fat attitudes. Perhaps those uncomfortable with seeing Effie rejected because she is fat are more comfortable with seeing her as Broadway world user Margot Channing argued, quote, tossed out because she was unreliable, erratic, a bitch, unprofess unprofessional, and most crucially, unable to adapt to the demands placed on black musicians and singers who were trying to cross over to the white pop mainstream. The meaning of Dreamgirls changes accordingly depending on whose body embodies Effie. Size matters. None of the women who played Effie on Broadway or understudied the role ever again played a romantic leading role on Broadway. The fictional Effie White was somehow more famous than the women who played her the practice of padding persists. Fat women continue being denied chances to play the full range of characters available to thin women. Black women are still routinely denied leading roles available to white women. And I should mention that there are even fewer opportunities for women actors of Asian, indigenous, Latin, and Middle Eastern descent. Fat women face, fat black women face intersecting and compounding structural barriers to employment in Broadway musicals. All of this represents a sad state of affairs for an industry 
that attempts to deliver a convincing performance of inclusivity eight performances a week. If fat suits represent a specific kind of straight jacket for performers, for Black women, they also play into another representational trope, the demand that the big Black lady stop the show. This cultural expectation emblematizes the paradox into which fat Black women performers are thrust by the Broadway musical, remain peripheral to the narrative, yet central to spectators' expectations of what musicals do. Dazzle us with your voice, but know your place, Broadway seems to say. Dream Girls continues to ring so true because Effie thrills audiences before being put into her place. She is the big black lady of the show, but she's also still a black woman in America. And though the actor playing her may or may not be fat, the contradictions of casting and playing Effie reveal the, ro the role and the show by extension, uh, the role, the show, and by extension, musicals themselves as sites of struggle over what it means to be a fat Black woman. Even when fat is fake and or disavowed, the history of casting Dreamgirls and the mixed messages the original production sent in its casting breakdowns and costuming admit that, to quote uh, singer-songwriter Fats Waller, thin may be in, but fat is where it's at. Thank you. Never to like immediately ask the question. <laughs> great. Oh, um, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Uh, really thought provoking. You know, my mind was going into a lot of different places, examining my own sensibilities towards the subject and prejudices and all of that. I find it interesting, sort of ironic, I guess, that we are the diet capital of the United States here in Durham. Um, having originated the rice diet, and I think it predates your coming to Durham, but used to be there would be fat people walking all around East Campus as part of a, a regimen of losing weight. So I think it's really interesting and ironic that you're coming out with this book here in Durham. Um, do you see any what do you see it as an answer uh, is, is sort of part one of the question. And also, how do you reckon with uh, taking, taking the fact that this is the diet capital, that sort of um, medicalizes, that's not the right word, but, you know, turns it into a medical issue, or at least recognizes that aspect of it. There's that sort of back and forth of, Okay, so if if our entertainment world and theater is a part of both mirroring society and also leading society into better places, which I think is the purpose of art in my mind, um, how do we how do you reconcile, okay, yeah, so fat ish is okay, but Fat fat is maybe a health issue. Where do we go with that? And how do we make sure that our representations, although honoring that all people are okay, still doesn't do a disservice to society? Yeah, I, thank you for that. I think one way to, that I conceptualize this is, is drawn from disability studies and the fact that there are many models of understanding disability. And so I'm definitely, you know, following more of a social model than a medical model. And, you know, I think as an individual, you have to consider both for yourself. Um, I'm not that kind of doctor, so I don't really engage with the medical model too much. And I do think the medical model has really pathologized size in really harmful ways. And, and at my point, I think in this, in this book and in, in the chapter I read today is that, um, you know, that medical model has seeped into um, aesthetics in that, you know, fat is something to, um, historically was something, you know, in, in theater that was uh, stigmatized, that was eschewed, that was shunned. And so to answer your first question though, about, you know, what do we do? Um, I think 
actually, the way I want to answer that is through this recent production that I saw, a, a regional production in Maryland of Beauty and the Beast that cast a fat black woman as Belle. Uh, one of the, maybe not the first, but one of the first times that that has happened. And um, so she was Belle and um, an actor whose leg was amputated. I have a picture in here that maybe I can hold up. Um, whose leg was amputated, played the beast. I can, you can come up and look at this later. I don't have a slide for it, but um, you know, so casting is the way that we can start to change attitudes. Um, because you, I went to see this show and it, it was in People Magazine. I mean, it got national press for its casting. And so you go in thinking you're going to pay attention to that the entire time, perhaps, and you don't. Within five minutes, you're just, you're fully accepting of whose body is playing the character. And so I, I, casting, I think, is a major way that we can change attitudes. And, um, you know, so more, more of that kind of casting, I think, will go a long way. I, I think TV and film are a little bit ahead of, of theater here. Um, uh, maybe the, the recent film, The Whale, um, as a notable exception. But um, yeah, theater is slow. So. Yeah, I actually, you know, in, in doing interviews for the book, for the book, I, I came to see that I, as an, as a performer, I always kind of had an antagonistic relationship to casting directors. And then doing research for this book, I realized that it, they're not so much the gatekeeper as producers and the creative team themselves, because the casting directors are trying to bring more people into the room and, and you know, uh, but they're, they are freelance uh, consultants hired by a production. And so they can only do so much. It's really, uh, you know, it's a holistic kind of ecosystem change that has to happen. It has to be that producers see that, uh, you know, when work like this is done, audiences show up for it. So, um, you know, for instance, the season on Broadway, A Strange Loop, which um, is about a, queer black fat guy um, and won the Pulitzer and the Tony and all these prizes. I think that success on Broadway will um, hopefully lead to further, further inclusively cast shows like that. And later this season, we have a, a play called Fat Ham, which uh, you know is similar uh, in terms of who plays the lead. So, uh, and actually says fat in the title, which I think, you know, is great. They don't avoid it, so. Um, just more, and that's really, it's, it's more, it means seeing it and, um, you know, showing up. Because if it happens and it fails, producers are gonna be less likely to take risks, um, you know, with all the money at stake in the future. First of all, I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing your first chapter I am curious, though, with regard to the book cover, mm -hmm. since the title of the book is about being heavyset. Oh, the talk. The talk. The talk. Ah, okay. Let me see. What's the title of your book? Again? The title of the book is, I'm getting there. Okay. Cool. <laughs> For that distinction. Yeah. Ah, Broadway Bodies. Yeah. I'm curious, understanding what the content of the book is, when I look at this picture, I see a traditional Broadway body. Yes. And I'm wondering if there was any discussion of having a person on the cover that reflects the content, more of the content of the book. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so the book has three sections that are about different, uh, different embodied identities. So there's one section on size, one section on uh, disability and one section on sexuality. But before that, the, the book opens with an introduction and then a chapter that's about the musical A Chorus Line and how A Chorus Line um, shored up this ideal of the Broadway body and made um, performers interchangeable because it was such a successful show that it needed to be replicated quickly. And um, so this is this image is, is the first replacement in a chorus line and ranking. 
and so um, uh, that's why the subtitle of the book is a critical history of conformity because this is the example of the body that people are being pressured to conform to. Um, I also uh, I, I had a hard time deciding on a cover image, and I I pulled friends and and strangers on Twitter, um, and I had an image from each of the book section, and this was by far the clear winner, and then my editor also liked it. So, um, but I did um, initially have a, an idea to have um, either Jennifer Holliday on the cover or um, Marissa Jarrett Renoker, who played Tracy Turnblad. So, but in the end, um, this this was the one we went with. And I actually was a student of Anne Ranking, so it was personally meaningful to me. So anyway, yeah, but thank you for that. I was interested in what you were saying about um, how television and uh, film may be quicker to sort of model inclusivity or progressiveness in terms of body representation, but theater seems slower. And I'd love to hear you talk about why you suppose that might be. And I'm curious if that has to do with the physical proximity and embodied intimacy between audience and performers in theater, the sort of like lack of veil um, or, or wall. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I, I'll go back to something I mentioned in the talk. Um, you know, how I was saying that Dreamgirls had these multiple workshops. Uh, that's because it takes so long to create a Broadway musical, uh, for better or worse. Um, and actually, A Chorus Line was the first uh, musical to do a workshop process. Uh, and so Dreamgirls picked up on that same director uh, six years later. And um, it just takes a really long time to put theater together in a way that, you know, on TV, if you're in an episodic drama, the writer's room can quickly pivot, you know, to write about what is happening right now. And so it can be more topical in a way. And theater just takes, takes years uh, to get on its feet. So, you know, on, on some sense it is, uh, it's due to that, uh, you know, but as I argue in the book, you know, and as I said in response to Dan's question, even though theater takes a long time to get made, casting can happen quicker, <laughs> quicker, quicker uh, at the end of the process. And that's where we can see immediate, we can see immediate change. Um, and I, that is starting to happen now. Uh, the book ends in 2020 because that was a, um, a, you know, a clear endpoint for Broadway musicals when Broadway shut down for a few years. And since since theater has reopened in 2021, uh, you know, we have started to see strides in this area. So well, I, hopefully they continue. Yeah. I'm not sure that's what. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm curious, you know, I'm kind of, I was very struck by the, the repeated returns to the role, right? Yeah. Um, 1994, you said 2007. And um, what's clearly not an issue anyway for her is age, right? So I'm, you know, where, whereas with film, age, Age is it you know it functions in a very different sort of way, I think. Um, you know, by the time you're in your thirties, you're only fit to be a grandmother, you know, that sort of thing. Um, um but um, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not very much. Um so um so I'm I'm just I'm very curious to hear, you know, why age does not wither her, you know. Um, well, I should say the last time she played the role in 2021. It was in this enormous outdoor theater that I think has 10,000 seats. So if you were very far away, you can't tell someone's age anyway. <laughs> um, I actually think, um, it, you know, it was this association with the role that she she initially tried to deny because she wanted or to move beyond because she wanted to have a career that wasn't just this role. And then um, in the book, I quote her later on saying that, you know, she lost all this weight after having gastric bypass surgery, which she talks about openly. And um, she was like, people didn't want the thin Jennifer. They wanted, you know, Effie Jennifer. And I think it just became a way for her to work um, was to do this role again and again. 
um, I actually saw the 2007 production in Atlanta. I was, I was rehearsing for a production at that theater at the week that they went up. So I got to go see her and um, it was, it was exciting and also kind of campy because it was 20, 26 years after the original and she was, you know, probably my age now playing a teenager and it just was, um, there, it was campy and yet there was this element of like worship. The audience was at her feet eating every word that came out of her mouth. You know, we were just, you know, laughing it up. So, um, I mean, in, in terms of age, you have to suspend your disbelief in theater a lot more than you do or than you can on film or on television. So uh, she's still singing these, all the songs from this show. She's about to do this nightclub act in, at this uh, club in New York called 54 Below. And um, they've been doing a lot of uh, promotional videos and stuff. And th they're of her singing, I am changing. And she's, you know, her Instagram handle is the real Jennifer Holiday Dream Girl or something like that. Um, so it, like she owns it now in a way that in that clip I showed from 2006 where she was, um, you know, conflicted about it. Uh, she, she's come to uh, see it, I think as, as her personal brand almost, you know, she relies on it. So. Can I, can I just ask a little follow up, which is really, you know, is this, so beyond her is age is age something that had to be addressed i mean this sort of the 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 lack of casting of older women yeah. you know was was it something that had to be addressed and was moved beyond in um on broadway or was it just never an issue really um there's kind of a trend of of older stars returning to roles that made them iconic, like like Jennifer Holliday and Effie, but also Carol Channing, who played Dolly Levi and Hello Dolly well into her 70s um, and brought that back to Broadway a few times. Um, so, it, you know, if there's this match of performer and role, it, audiences will suspend disbelief about age, but otherwise it is really um, kind of another uh, third rail issue that's not discussed, but is is visible to anyone who goes to the theater who you don't see. Um, and, you know, I should say, really, what I write about in the book is, is all obvious. Like, if you, if you go to the theater and you see who's on stage, you're going to see everything I, you have seen everything I, I wrote about. And part of what I wanted to do in the book is to actually make, make that part of the historical record. Um, to put down what we all know to be true if we go to the theater uh, to to make that known in a way that um, you know theater is ephemeral and it, it disappears. So uh, to to put it all down to say this is this is how it was and um, this is who was who was there and who was not and um, age is definitely. Someone asked me in an interview recently, what are other categories that you could have written about for the book? And um, I thought, well. Uh, age is one, height is another, although the, the book opens with a story about me talking about being short and lying about it, but um, who opens a book by lying about themselves, but um, <laughs> I did. Um, so uh, yeah, so those are other, yeah, that's definitely an, an interesting area of inquiry. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Um, but I have just a little question. Why did she got a uh, uh, gastric bypass? Was it because of like psychological problem or was it medical or because of the public shaming or does it, is it related to Effie's role or what? Um, you know, if I'm remembering right, she got it because she wanted to work more. And she talked about that, that she felt she had to become thin in order to work. And of course, you know, it didn't happen. She kept returning to the role where, you know, she wasn't thin. And um, you know, that's why I said earlier that like, she says everybody wanted the old Jennifer, nobody wanted the new Jennifer. And um, 
Yeah. So uh, as far as I know, it was it was about having to look a certain way to be employable. So, um, yeah, it's, and it's sad, you know, that it didn't happen. <laughs> like what she wanted didn't happen. And um, yeah. I will say the, um, the most recent time she came back to Broadway was in the, a featured role in The Color Purple. And she did play um, this, uh, the, the sexy character in that show, Shug Avery. Um, so, you know, it's not the romantic lead, but she finally, in her latest role as a middle-aged woman, she did get to play, um, you know, the, the desirable subject in that show. So, you know, uh, it's, it didn't all end up um, only bad for Jennifer. She's, she's still um, uh, plugging away. I want to refer back to what uh, this man asked you in terms of what would it take to make the change? And I believe we're all familiar with the fact that Broadway is referred to as the great white way. Yep. And in your, uh, in the comment with the woman who played um, in Hairspray, when she says, I'm fat. Yeah. That's what it is. And so the great white way, <laughs> while I know it refers to the lights, but a lot of people, I mean, I just wonder about the subconscious of, Broadway having that name and yeah. then the type of people that are chosen to represent Broadway in the different shows. Yeah. Um, actually, in one of the uh, sections, one of the chapters in the section on ability, I um, open by saying Broadway's nicknames unintentionally call attention to its structural inequalities, perhaps most famously in the great white way. Another nickname, the fabulous invalid, Takes, a, takes, a, takes its name from a 1938 play by Kaufman Hart and refers to the perennial lament among theater people that Broadway is in perpetual decline. If the former nickname, at least when used ironically, admits Broadway's white supremacy, it's actually a reference to the bright lights of the theater marquees, the latter points to the ableism endemic in the industry. You read my, you read my book, you teed me up for that. <laughs> Oh, again, in, in thinking about changing things, um, and, and I'm not sure about this, but, and, and I guess I just read that it's like five theaters were just acquired by... ATG. The yeah. yeah. So it seems like Broadway theaters are increasingly monopolistic enterprises, um, which I'm guessing that the top, I mean, Needlelander and... And these others are probably not a diverse set of folks in the ownership positions of the Broadway theaters themselves. And do you think that that, you know, we can we can have directors who are, you know, and, I, and diverse, I actually don't really like that word because it's so meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, people who are black, people who are Latino, you know, we can have all of those folks represented in terms of being directors and even playwrights a bit being produced, but at the highest level of control over who gets a theater, um, it's not. And yeah, um, could we break up the monopolies? Well, um, <laughs> looking back historically, it's uh, Broadway's always been a monopolistic business model. And um, I, I heard the playwright Dominique Morisot talk this summer and I never forgot this line that she said at, that uh, Broadway is about real estate and uh, you know, the white theater owners are the landlords. And, uh, and that's kind of all you need to know uh, in, uh, in one sense. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think there's ever been a Broadway theater not owned by, um, you know, either the Schubert's uh, or a white family, essentially. Um, there may be one or two, but I'm having a hard time even thinking of what they might have been. And, you know, looking back 120 years ago, uh, the Broadway theater owners were, uh, there were monopolies that were broken up in theater ownership across the country. The Schubert family, um, they were brothers. They, uh, they broke down the first uh, monopoly of theater called the syndicate only to set up their own, which then got uh, 
broken up by the Great Depression, and um, but they still own the majority of Broadway theaters, and uh, the Nederlanders own the next most, and then the Jew Jamson Group, which just merged with ATG, a British uh, theatrical conglomerate, as you mentioned, uh, they own you know, five or six yeah. now, and um, then the other couple are nonprofit owned, um, so they're all still uh, very much owned by the same people. The only kind of um, difference that I can see is that uh, you know Jordan Roth owns uh, Jew Jamson and he's queer, but you know uh, to use today's lingo, he's a total nepo baby. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, at least he's using his theater to advance uh, the politics he believes in. His dad is a Trump supporter and he's very much not that. So, um, you know, and we can see in the kind of work he's I mean, letting rent his theaters that, um, you know, but it's still that it, it's real estate. It's it's what who's going to be a tenant that pays rent consistently and for the longest amount of time. That's ultimately also what it comes down to. So, uh, uh, a comment and a and a question. I I only saw um, a chorus line once, and I'm sure it was in the 1980s. <laughs> and and it's funny how. Um, a line really stood out to me that I still remember. It's something like, don't pop your hip, Cassie. Yeah. Right? <laughs> about that, that conformity yeah. that you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you've looked at the opera, Metropolitan Opera at all for, for these issues, because um, certainly lots of women of size, <laughs> you know, on stage all evening, we're crying because she's Mimi or she's Isolde or whatever. And it's all about the voice and hopefully she can act and, and we're grateful. <laughs> and um, there's been, you know, lots of, lots of interesting yeah. casting there for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I did look into opera as I was, I was doing this research and um What's interesting to me is how opera is also adopting these aesthetics too, because, and for instance, like Jennifer Holliday, after she lost the weight, um, Deborah Voigt um, also underwent a lot of weight loss at a certain point in her career, and her voice changed a little bit, and she stopped being cast in operas. And so um, at the same time that she was, you know, being openly body shamed for being uh, fat, as an opera singer, even though that is the cultural expectation and often the artistic expectation too, that, you know, fat lady sings, that's from opera, right? Um, and, but I'm also curious about opera, how it's still so gendered. I mean, male opera singers don't always face the same pressures that uh, women opera singers do. Um, I mean, men feel the social pressure to be thin as well, but I think, it's, it's different for women. Um, you know, men don't have industries entirely aimed at weight loss for us. You know, um, now they're starting to, if you look at my Instagram feed, I'm getting a lot of those ads, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So opera is not immune to, to the stigma either. And um, for better or worse, you know, if you go, if you go to the opera, like if you go to the Met, you're going to see um, thinner singers now than you would have seen 20 years ago. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.